prepare your history lesson somewhere in my sermon, but today I figured I'd start with your history lesson. Mm -hmm. January 20th, 1961, the 35th President of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, gave his inaugural speech. We observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom, symbolizing an end as well as a beginning, signifying renewal as well as change. For I have sworn before you, and Almighty God, the same solemn oath our forebearers prescribed nearly a century and three quarters ago. The world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And yet, the same revolutionary beliefs for which our forebearers fought are still the issue around the globe. The belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. In your hands, my fellow citizens, more than in mine, will rest the final success or failure of our course. Since this country was founded, each generation of Americans has been summoned to give testimony to its national loyalty. The graves of young Americans who answered the call to service surround the globe. Now the trumpet summons us again, not as a call to bear arms, though arms we need, not as a call to battle, though battle embattled we are, but a call to bear the burden of long struggle, twilight struggle, year in and year out. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, you may remember that from Romans 12:12. 12, 12. A struggle against the common enemies of man, tyranny, poverty, disease, and war itself. <clears throat> Can we forge against these enemies a grand and global alliance, north and south, east and west, that can assure a more fruitful life for all mankind? Will you join in that historic effort? In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shirk from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you, what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but together what we can do for the freedom of man. Finally, whether you are citizens of America or citizens of the world, ask, us, ask of us the same high standards of strength and sacrifice which we ask you. With a good conscience, our only sure reward, with history the final judge, of our deeds, let us go forth and lead the land we love, asking His blessing and His help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. <coughs> and so, my fellow Christians, I ask not what our God can do for you, but what can we do for our God? Ephesians 4 tells us that grace is given to each of, them, each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. The fact is, God does not save us so we can sit, but so we can serve. Just as there is no such thing as a non-functioning mem member of the human body, so there ought not to be such a thing as a non-functioning member of the body of Christ. If God has saved us from our sin, He has called us to serve Him in some way in accordance with our gifts and abilities. Romans 12 tells us, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought but rather think of yourself with sober judgment 
in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each one of us, each one of us has a body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of, each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it diligently. If God has saved us from the awful judgment we deserve, then we are not our own. We've been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus. We are under orders. Paul did not dream up with the idea of becoming an apostle. It wasn't his career objective determined by taking an, an occupational exam or a personality test. He was an apostle according to the commandment of God our Savior. That means that serving Jesus is mandatory for all who have been saved by his blood. We didn't volunteer for Jesus' army. We've been called. <coughs> Service is not an option. The Bible doesn't teach that some Christians are called to serve God and others are not. Every Christian is saved to serve. The matter of how depends on the type of service in which we are called. And we are all each called differently and individually as we are given individual gifts from above. 1 Peter 4 tells us, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. God hasn't saved anyone, so we can just sit around. Does that mean that service is easy or without struggles? <clears throat> Not at all. Serving Christ means waging war against the spiritual forces of darkness, and warfare is not easy. Sometimes warriors get <clears throat> discouraged. Joshua tells us, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. And do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The counter for discouragement is hope. Christ himself is our hope in serving. Our hope is not in religion. Our hope is not in human beings. Our hope is not in a better world. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' is Lord. First Peter tells us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. It takes focus. Romans 8 tells us, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Focus on the things of the Spirit. And sometimes we have to endure as we're seeking that one. Endure hardship as the good soldier of Jesus Christ, tells us in 2 Timothy 2.3. Don't just do what we have to do to get by, but work heartily as Christ's servants doing what God wants us to do. Work with a smile on our face, always keeping in mind that no matter who happens to be giving the orders, we're really serving God. Sometimes I've been in some situations in my military career that it was pretty hard to serve with a smiling face, but God commands us to serve with a smiling face. Ephesians 6, 7 and 8 tells us, Rendering service with a good will is to the Lord 
and not to man. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. God has a plan for our lives. God calls us to serve him and other people. God calls us to share the truth of the gospel with those who are heading to a lost eternity away from him. God calls us to minister to those who desperately need to hear the message of salvation for themselves. God calls us to be both salt and light in this bland, sin-sick world. God calls us to serve him. And God also calls us to guard our hearts in this endeavor. As Proverbs 4.23 tells us, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Set your heart on serving Christ. <coughs> I'm trying to breathe, Karen. I'm trying to breathe. <laughs> there are only two options for us. We can choose to serve ourselves, or choose to serve God. On one side, not to fully live our lives as disciples of Jesus, or live as his servants not obedient to the will of God, or fully serve the will and purpose of God, follow our own desires, or have a relationship with God through our faith in Jesus Christ. The choice to serve is rooted in a word called commitment. Who are we committed to? The people today will tell you, tell you that they can't commit to anything, but in reality, they do, we do, we commit to all kinds of things, to playing sports, or to watching sports and rooting for your favorite team. We commit to our careers and our jobs. We commit to the pursuit of money, the pursuit of pleasure, to watching our favorite TV shows, to our hobbies, to ourselves, and wanting to live the life our own way. But instead, we need to commit to eternal things, the things that matter to the Lord. We need to serve the Lord. As John 12, 26 tells us, If anyone serves me, he must follow me where I am. There will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. At the heart of true Christianity, true discipleship, is knowing and loving God. Being in a real relationship with him, living in his children, living with a servant heart. Westside family, we need to choose to willingly submit control of our lives to God in service to Him. Colossians 3 tells us, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Our focus is to be on pleasing God and serving Him just as Jesus did. <coughs> Jesus came as a servant with full commitment to serving the will of his Father. Mark 10, and also you find the same verse in Matthew 20, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Take a moment and think. What if Christ came to be served, not to serve? What would our world look like? What would our salvation look like? I don't think our salvation would ever happen if he came to be served. He would not have suffered in our place. He would never have had to endure the pain of the cross. If he had come to be served, he could never have been the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Jesus came with full expectation and willingness to be the servant and not the served. We, as followers of our Lord Jesus, must also be willing servants of our Savior and King. We must be willing to have a servant heart. Hebrews 6 tells us, For God is not unjust, so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still. And perhaps the greatest illustration of having a servant heart is found in John chapter 13. 
there in the upper room on the night before his crucifixion, Jesus demonstrated what it means to have a servant heart. Imagine the scene. Jesus is there with his disciples. Everything has been prepared for his last meal with them. Except one thing is missing. According to the customs of the time, there should have been a servant present with a bowl of water and a towel. And that servant was there for one reason and one reason only. That was to wash off the dirty and dusty feet that they had coming into the house. But there was no servant in that room. So who would lower themselves to the position of servant and perform that task? Can you imagine the disciples looking around, expecting someone to turn up to the job? Can you imagine them thinking, that is a disgusting job, that is a job I would never want to do? Then the perfect example of a servant heart happened. Jesus stands, takes off his outer garments, puts a towel around his waist, pours water in the bowl, and begins to wash the feet of his disciples. The Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, takes on the role of the servant. Jesus did what no one else was willing to do. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Jesus provided his disciples and us now with the perfect example of what it means to have a servant heart. After washing their feet, he put his robe on again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? We must also be willing to humble ourselves to serve others. True blessing comes from having a servant heart and a willingness to serve others. Joshua 24, 15 tells us, But if the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers, gods, the gods your forefathers serves beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. We are to learn, we are to live with servant hearts and be willing to pick up the servant's towel and serve our God, our King, our fellow Christian, our fellow man, wherever it is that God leads us, we need to be willing to serve. We are to live as servants of our God. We are to live as people who are committed to the plans and purposes of God. We are to live as disciples of Christ who are committed to meeting the needs of others. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. In Christ, God calls us to live as servants, to serve others, to serve God, as our Lord Jesus did. He is the perfect example of having a servant heart. Let us choose to have a heart like his. Luke 4, 8 says, Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So what is the aim of our service? Ultimately, it is to bring glory to God. Romans 19 in my Bible is marked, Marks of the true Christian. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly, with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints seek to show hospitality. In a word, serve. <coughs> Galatians 5.13 tells us, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. We're not saved by serving, but we are saved for serving. We cannot serve God until we've been set free by Jesus. 
It's the prerequisite for serving. Until we experience the transforming power of God's grace in our life, we're too enslaved to our own hurts, habits, and hang-ups to think upon, think about much other, about others. Without the freedom of forgiveness, we'll end up serving for the wrong ideas, the wrong reasons, trying to earn the approval of others, trying to run away from our pain, trying to remedy our guilt, or just trying to impress God. Service motivated, motivated by these illegitimate reasons is bound to leave us burned out and bitter in the end. God is always looking at our heart. <coughs> Serve willingly and eagerly out of love for Jesus and gratitude for all he's done for us. 1 Samuel 24 tells us, Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. <coughs> Take a moment. Truly consider what great things he has done for you. When I retired from the Army in January of 2009, it was nowhere in my mind or my heart that I would ever be preaching and teaching. That was not, when I took off the uniform, was my focus. But God landed me here at Westside about seven years ago, and it's been an opportunity for me to personal growth and to serve. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 and 6 tells us, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. And I hope Patrick doesn't mind, but I'm going to use him as an example. My gifts that the Lord has given me to work here at Westside are different than the gifts that he has given Patrick to work here at Westside. Patrick's gifts, I believe, are ministerial and evangelistic more than mine. Patrick truly cares for the flock that we have here, and he takes the word outside these four walls. Patrick is a true servant. Whereas I feel my service is in the preaching and the teaching. Where Patrick is the evangelist, I'm the preacher. We all have different gifts to serve here. And I look up to Patrick as a wonderful example of serving others with a truly servant heart. And I thank you for all your efforts you've done here at Best Night Patrick. Thank you. I need to let you know I'm in a conundrum with my service. Um, for those who don't know, that, uh, my job outside of here, I work at Gonzaga University in the security department as a dispatcher. About two months ago, the director of security resigned. He called me into his office before he left and said, I want you to apply for my position when it comes open. So, kind of nice move up. Uh, it's definitely, for me, having retired out of the Army, when you're in the Army, you keep moving for higher and higher levels of um, responsibility. Um, I'm just a lowly dispatcher at GU. The directorship is a huge jump in responsibility, something that I do in the Army, did in the Army, I would like to do in my civilian life. However, I'm in a conundrum. It is definitely a prestigious move, and what about double my, more than double my current salary at Gonzaga University? My conundrum being, if I take on that position, I might have to give up being up here twice a month. I have a conundrum. I need your prayers for what the will of God is going to be with my life and going forward. So, so I haven't com fully committed to actually applying for the job. Um, so I'm still trying to seek the will of God in all of this, because I know it would probably affect <coughs> my service here. And I have a wonderful life, and just being a lowly dispatcher at GU, I have my mornings to be with Lisa and do things on my honey-do list. I'm a morning person being an army guy. Um, by the end of the day, I'm no good, but uh, I have a lot of energy in the morning for Lisa, so you can get a lot of work out of me. If I go to the director job, I'll be at the end of the day, the stress of the administration, parents, students, and life. And, and I might not have the time, because if you don't know, I also have time in my job to make my sermons. It's a wonderful job. So, so I have to give up a lot if I go that direction. So I need your prayers 
because I'm in a conundrum with my service. I want to continue serving. <coughs> so if you were feeling like you have to do some <clears throat> kind of grandioso service project to fulfill your service to God, that's not what I am saying here today. But God is calling us to serve. It might be as simple as putting your name in the empty spaces on our back bulletin to serve your brothers and sisters at Westside. If you don't know, on the back bulletin is the hey, those to serve, the setup, the greeting, and the cleanup. There's still a couple of spaces back there still open. So it might be as simple as just serving your brothers and sisters here. But whatever it is, seek God, find your service. And so, my fellow Christians, ask not what our God can do for you, ask what we can do for our God. And I leave you with Hebrews 13, 15, and 16. Through him, let us continually offer up sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that is his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Use our God-given gifts to serve Him, to serve others.